hello everyone. Um, still adapting to this uh, new format of being in person. I was used to delivering all these talks in shorts and slippers from the waist down and then a shirt. But um, so it's very interesting to be back in person and thank you for everyone for coming out to this discussion on art and activism in the London Irish LGBTQ plus diaspora. So I'm Morris Casey and I'm the historian in residence at Epic Irish Immigration Museum and the Department of Foreign Affairs. And I guess just to begin, just this kind of basic idea about the, the format of the talk, it's going to be a kind of a free forming discussion between myself and our four panelists. Uh, one quirk of the format is that unfortunately Richard couldn't be with us in person today, but he is here on an iPad. And so we hear the, the, the divine voice coming out of the speaker system. That's uh, Richard. <laughs> um, and before I introduce or I ask all of our panelists to introduce themselves, I guess just to frame the talk and the idea for the talk, it comes, of course, from London's important history in terms of, of Irish LGBTQ plus emigration, particularly its importance for um, artists in emigration. And that goes back decades, even centuries, to people like Kate O'Brien and, and Oscar Wilde or up to more contemporary history, such as the Brixton Ferries in Railton Road in Brixton. But also the idea for this talk comes from a particular experience that I had here in the London Irish Centre in the summer of 2018 when I gave a talk which was on the history of, of Ireland's two referendums, so the marriage equality referendum and the repeal referendum. And what was really interesting to me about that talk was listening into all the conversations that everybody had afterwards, and particularly the conversations between different generations of emigrants, different generations of activists. So I think that that's something that is really keen to foster in this talk. So um, that's kind of my, my framing, and I guess now I'll go to everyone else to introduce themselves, and I'll begin with Cherry, and then Eamon, Cass, and Richard. Hello, yeah, like Morris says, it's really nice to have a live audience. It's, it's very exciting and actually nerve-wracking in a different way. Um, yeah, I'm Cherry Smith. I was brought up in Northern Ireland and I left nearly 40 years ago. And I think coming to London really enabled me to come out and also to become a writer. Um, I've written, I think, four collections of poetry, a novel and two kind of queer cultural studies books. Um, and I also write about art and I'm interested in abstraction. I think because... Uh, I like writing about things that the person doing the art doesn't have the words, and I do, so that's another thing I do. Thanks. Hi, I'm Eamon Summers. Um, I'm from Dublin. I came over here to London in the 1980s. I've been writing certainly since I was uh, in my teens, uh, although I've just published my first novel, sprightly young age of 70. Yeah. I've written lots of uh, short stories and uh, experimented with poetry recently, but uh, they're not my forte. Um, yeah, it's lovely to be here. Hi, my name is Kat. My artist name is It's Just Kat. Uh, I'm from Cork. I actually haven't moved here yet. I'm between Ireland and here. I'm trying to move here. I just finished my degree in Dublin. Uh, I'm a pop artist, so I've lived in Dublin for the last five years. So, uh, yeah, I'm kind of relatively new with writing and stuff like that, my own music and everything, so I don't have much out. But, uh, yeah, I'm in the process of moving here at the moment, so different kind of perspective, I guess. And Richard? Me. <laughs> uh, I'm Richard Malone. I'm from Wexford, Art Cavan in Wexford. Um, I moved here in 2010 ish. Um, an artist and designer, and my practice kind of runs in and out of those things. The most visible thing that I, I guess I do is the London Fashion Week shows. Um, we just did one on Saturday at the VA, and we've got an exhibition that's on at the National Museum in Dublin at the minute in conversation with Eileen Gray. Um, yeah, and in terms of activism, I guess it kind of goes across everything I do. Um, not always particularly forward facing, but it can be in terms of guaranteeing living wage, fundraising for craft, um, for other artists, sponsorships and bursaries, um, 
I'm quite involved with education in London in terms of um, working with students from BIPOC and low income backgrounds. Um, I got a lot of help as a kind of love from a low income family myself when I got there. So I kind of give back in that way. And then, yeah, I was quite um, vocal or at least involved with the repeal and the marriage equality things in London. Yeah, do lots of different stuff. <laughs> Great. Um, so I suppose I should also say by way of introduction, uh, this exhibition um, that we curated at Epic uh, Out in the World, Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora. Richard was the artist uh, who commissioned an artwork by Richard for the exhibition itself. And uh, you can see that in Epic in Dublin if you find yourselves over in Dublin, but hopefully as well, it will um, <clears throat> be here in London before too long as well. So that's also part of what brings us together this evening. So we'll start the conversation, then we'll have loads of time for audience Q&A and, and a really broad discussion getting everyone involved. So hopefully you can think up some questions to ask our panelists. But to begin, I wanted to go one by one again and ask really the broadest question I can, which is, do you think that your art is connected to your activism? And if so, how? So Chair, we'll start with you once more. Um, I say in a poem, becoming a lesbian gave me a voice and took away my tongue. So I had this great, you know, you know, like surge of sexual energy, desire, lots of things to say, and then I was terrified to say any of it. Um, but it was definitely to do with my sexual and gender identity that, you know, prompted my writing and felt that it was really important to bring all of those things to being Irish. And um, I was part of a kind of, it was a lesbian reading um, poetry performing group that, that was going. And, and so to have a live audience that was really hungry for your work, that was, that was definitely very inspiring. I also became a lesbian journalist, writing about a lot of queer issues. And then I curated the Lesbian and Gay Film Festival for a few years. And all the time writing and thinking about representation, I guess it was that thing of positive representation that was very much part of our coming out in the 80s. Um, and I suppose perhaps now my um, queer identity is less important to, to my writing. It infuses it, but there are lots of other intersectional questions, being a woman, being in late capitalism, being in climate catastrophe. Those feel like they're drawing me as a human being and someone who's interested in how we ethically respond to that stuff. Mm. Yeah, I would definitely say that um, my uh, my values and my beliefs in, infuse everything that I write. Um, the main character in my novel, Dolly Considine's Hotel, is Julian, and he has something that he calls his inception statement, a bit like a mission statement, and he said he's dedicated to youth and truth and beauty. So. I would definitely say that that influences me. Um, I think everything I've written has been has been related to being gay uh, and or Irish, probably. They're all set in Ireland, um, but all my char not all my characters are gay, but um, there are gay characters in everything I write. Um, don't know. I'm sure we'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. yes. So for me, since I'm relatively new to the music scene in Ireland, <clears throat> what I've picked up along the way is that it's like a very kind of like close knit, you could almost say snobby at times industry to be in in Dublin. And there isn't a lot of room for like pop music in general, not to mind like the likes of like Kylie Minogue and stuff like that is like shunned. So like Kylie and Lady Gaga and all those have like a massive following by the LGBT community and uh, loads of my friends are part of that community. So I guess with me just being really genuine in my music and true to myself, I'm trying to create like a little pocket, but make it bigger for like LGBT music in Dublin. Not that I'm, I'm trying to write about it or anything like that in particular, but just kind of staying true to myself and opening up that kind of horizon a bit more in Ireland is kind of what I'm trying to do anyways. Richard? It's me. Yeah. 
What was the is, what was the question? So I, <laughs> I guess you kind of, you kind of addressed it in your intro. It's yeah. the ways in which your artistic practice is infused with your activism. Um, yeah, I think that's a good. I mean, it's like for me, I think when you like when I I come from a family of like what I learn now are like low skilled work workers. So basically, like carpenters or people who would work and have worked in the linen industry when it was still there, and having gone through sort of Originally, I did performance art and sculpture, and then I went through fashion school in London. And I think that there's a real opportunity, I guess. And I find opportunity is a funny word, but of creating change that's quite localized. And like when I first graduated a couple of years ago, in terms of like sustainability or ethical making, that wasn't a conversation that was happening. Certainly not about clothes that were still desirable and boundary pushing and all of those things. So in that sense, I think activism can really be part of like a conversation that you don't see happening because it's very fashionable and I mean that not just in the fashion industry generally to look like you care and I think that it's really important like with certain like industries that involve making and craft it's quite an inspiring thing to be a part of where you're actually like guaranteeing living wages or, or and that's kind of what the term activism means to me it's actually about being very active and not about looking like you're doing the work whereas you can actually be doing it and there's such a huge parallel between those two things. Um, and for me, it's always just been a part of what I do. I'm quite sort of um, rowdy about it because like being from Wexford, whenever I went to Dublin, people were always like, oh, you're from the country. And that would be like your identity. And then when you came to England, your identity becomes, or oh, you're working class and you're Irish and you're queer and people put all of these boxes around you, and especially press. So I think being there and challenging those things and making work on your own terms is, kind of the beginning of activism and then all of the things around legislation that you become I think really come from your community as well or you know it's never kind of one person leading those things it's a real communal shift usually a massive one and I think um, that's quite easy to become a part of in big cities it's quite easy to find information and create sort of change or speak about things more openly and have a dialogue. Mm -hmm. Thanks Richard I think that opens up a lot of things that I want to circle back to you and one of the way I, I kind of want to circle back to them is to ask a simple question, but um, to unpack it, just going to ask you when you came to London or in Kat, or in Kat's case, why you want to come to London. But really, I want you to tell me about what were those kind of push factors that made you leave Ireland? Um, and what's the difference then between Richard and Kat and their experience of leaving and Amy and Cherry and those, those different periods? Um, I came in 1982, there seemed to be no jobs. Um, I was in Dublin at Trinity and it was just a really depressing time and um, very poor and just felt impossible to stay there. And I came to London for one year <laughs> to do a postgraduate diploma and then of course I stayed because I got involved in Greenham and peace activism and feminism and it just felt like it was kind of going forward in time at that time. I don't see it like that now, but it, it just felt like there were so many incredibly exciting things to be part of and to learn from. And it um, was such a strong sense of community. So in a way, I had that more than I would almost had it in Dublin. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a fantastic time to come. And then the whole 80s, as Eamon knows, was just full of really exciting and sometimes scary activism around AIDS and ACT UP and outrage and sort of lying in the traffic with Jimmy Somerville and Derek Jarman and, and just really putting our bodies in the line because our friends were dying. Um, and that's had a lot of parallels with what's been happening around COVID. But that's maybe going off topic. We can come back to that. Mm. Um, so that's some of that beginning. So Eamon, I know that before you, you, before you came to London, you were very involved in, in Dublin activism as well. So I guess talk about that experience of, did you leave because you'd reached a kind of, um, I don't know, a, a kind of a natural conclusion with what you were working on in terms of your activist life in Dublin? Or what were you leaving? No, I think um, in, in 1986, we, well, first of all, we had the Pro-Life Amendment in 1983. Um, in June 1986, uh, we had the, the, 
the failure to remove the constitutional ban on divorce in Ireland. So it was, it was really a, a despair-filled time for me. Um, I, had, I was uh, married at that time, uh, technically. I had been separated for um, about eight years from my wife. But she decided uh, she was going to emigrate to Australia and take our two children. I was, I have to say, not as distressed as perhaps I, I wasn't in touch with any, any distress, distress I felt. I was recovering from the guilt of um, destroying the relationship by coming out as gay after a, a couple of years in the marriage. So. I thought it was only right. Um, and my boy, I had been made redundant from the double glazing company that I was working for on the installation side. Uh, and about 18 months before, and as Charlie says, work was very difficult to come by. And most importantly, my uh, boyfriend at that time, and I'm gonna say that for the city of the audience, quiet as anything, um, decided that he was coming to the UK to do some postgrad stuff. So I said, well, F that. I have no reason to stay in Dublin. It's time to go and start a new life. And, and so Kath, then what links drawing you to, to that? Um, lots of different reasons. I would say like the main two would be the divide in the music industry between like the non-queer musicians and like the queer musicians. Like it's almost like you're assigned to different things for the type of person that you are like the festivals the radio shows like there's like set ones that you're kind of you're supposed to apply for if you're queer or whether you're not queer so that is already really strange like that's not a thing over here you can just apply for things you get asked to do things and everyone's kind of in the same kind of like category I guess and also just opportunity like there isn't that much opportunity for queer pop music in Dublin, I feel. Especially like even just the reception I get from walking down the street in Dublin, like I draw a lot of attention, like most places I go, but in Dublin, like the homophobic slurs that I get still is really awful. So they're, they're like the two main reasons as to why I would want to leave. So like the division and the opportunity. And Richard, what brought you here in 2010? What made me move? That yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's a similar thing. It's like uh, opportunity, you know, and I think I'm like, I was the, f the first person in my family to kind of contemplate going to third level education. And when I said like, I done quite well in leaving certain stuff, and I was very young doing my leaving cert, I was 16 when I did it. And everyone was like, well, you're way too young to kind of go straight into things. So I did a sort of course in art at a fee tech level and I, I sort of I was so excited by everything because it was so different from what I'd kind of grown up with or experience or anything like sculpture or ceramics or video I kind of latched on to bits of everything because it was all so new to me and then I kind of I guess I continued that with my practice in terms of doing performance art and all of those things and I was really interested in like a craft and a skill so I think that's why maybe fashion happened um, and they advised me to go to St Martin's and I didn't really realize it was such a big thing at the time. Um, and when I applied, you know, I had no real skill set and I was far too young, but I think that they must have thought it was just so funny um, that I was even there, you know, with no clue how to do anything. But that made for a really good mix, I think, and it gave me a really kind of good, different opinion. And I think I was just searching a kind of, again, a community, because, you know, like we're, where we are, my, before I'd moved, I was like working on building sites with my dad and it was kind of like monotonous. And as much as I kind of liked those materials now and I'm quite nostalgic about that time, it's also like, I don't know, you, you just crave something very different. And London at that time was a real slap in the face. It was also sort of, I think before the conservative government had done what they did now, it was like the last time that you kind of go and pay like smaller fees you could get grants and stuff. And, you know, I 
the first year that I got there, I had like a credit union loan. That was the maximum I'd get. And this, I just kind of winged it from there. I worked all of the different fire jobs and all of those things. Worked in all the cafes around Brick Lane, did some illustration on the side, made it sort of happen. And I think I was very lucky because that was the last year you could go at that fee. And if I'd gone the year later, I'd have literally been fucked because it was too expensive. Um, so I think it was just like a very kind of situational thing that was a real mix of things coming together. And then, you know, at, at that art school at the time, it was like in Charing Cross Road, it was the middle of London. You could still do whatever you want. You could, you know, literally drink, take drugs, smoke inside the studios as long as you got your work done and you were passionate about it and you had a point of view. And I think that's really what I was looking for. And I certainly wasn't going to find it in sort of art cabin. <laughs> I'm expert, I don't think. Yeah, I think what's interesting about kind of everyone's answers there is that uh, there is both a sense of change. Certainly, when we think of legislation, right, like Ireland is, is transformed in terms of legislation, but also our attention of attitudes, whether that's homophobic attitudes or the necessity of just pushing people out on the merit of opportunity. Um, and one thing I guess I do as a historian is that I look at these sort of broad trends and then I put these categories on them, which people may or not sense you know is is accurate to their experience and the exhibition is ireland's lgbtq plus diaspora which is perhaps not a, a hat that anyone has worn would anyone here ever have thought of themselves in that framework part of not just the irish diaspora but specifically an irish lgbtq plus diaspora no initially i was part of the you know right to diaspora um, Beckett and Joyce and Elizabeth Bowen. Um, and I just, I suppose I acquired the uh, uh, Irish queer diasporic label later. And that was partly, funny enough, um, influenced by ILGO, who were this great Irish lesbian and gay organization in New York. And they were kind of infiltrating uh, the Patrick's and Patrick's parade. And, they were just so vocal and I think they got pushed off the parade and they had to fight for their presence and it just made everybody have these conversations and I just thought, yeah, I want to be there. I don't think that was happening so much. I mean, I think there were queer contingents and things like Troops Out and Freedom, obviously, but the Irish queer thing, diaspora, happened for me more through New York and San Francisco and then because of Irish Americans who are much less apologetic than Irish, British, whatever that is. We don't even have a name for it. So, you know, you talk about categories. I think that's quite interesting. Um, and, you know, thinking about the unification of Ireland, you know, people say, well, we have Nigerian Irish, so why can't we have British Irish? Like, can we accommodate Protestants in the North through that appellation? And that feels quite exciting to me, to change the terms in which it's talked about. Yeah, and I think that's kind of, um, it's this project which, the Irish Lesbian Gay Organization in New York were really just so out of their time in terms of articulating expanding Irishness, right? Making Irishness more hospitable mm -hmm. to all these different identities, which I think is why they're such an important part of the story. I wonder if anyone else has kind of any thoughts on that, on you know, whether there is such a thing as Ireland's LGBTQ plus diaspora, and does it is that useful a useful way to kind of think through this immigrant story? I don't know, certainly when I came here first, I was working in Haringey in the Lesbian and Gay Unit there. Um, and I had access to some funds and we were, uh, we had entertainments and um, for the Haringey community, but the wider community as well. And we had uh, groups like um, the Harry Marys, who uh, you know, many remembers. <laughs> and uh, Jack and Potatoes. And Indeed, there's somebody here, a uh, gentleman here this evening, who um, is very closely associated with Jack and Potatoes. And they played um, at uh, Cayley's that we organized in, um, in uh, the Lesbian and Gay Center in, in Cowcross Street. And I think from recollection here as well, um, Cayley's we call them, of course. <laughs> And so out of that, out of my day job, uh, grew up um, the Irish Gay Network and, and subsequently the Irish Gay Helpline. And I think it was, it was appropriate and important for 
newly arrived or something. And for people, some older, um, I remember meeting in the in locomotive, we had a, a, a meeting there, the first uh, meeting. I can't even remember where the locomotive was. It was somewhere in Canada, I believe. And I, we were upstairs, and I was I went downstairs uh, to check for something or to buy a drink, maybe. The bar was downstairs. And I got talking to this um, elderly Irishman. Hi. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he acknowledged that uh, he was gay, but uh, he wouldn't dare come up the stairs and, and join the, um, the, the group that we were the group meeting that we were going to have. Uh, but so I think there was a need for a network. I think there is there's a closeted uh, diaspora, but equally I think um, I um, will tell you a story. I was uh, uh, in 1981. I went. I was still living in Ireland, and I went to Turin as a, a part of the delegation from the NGF in Dublin to the International Gay Association, which subsequently renamed the International Lesbian and Gay Association. And I came to England on the boat, uh, uh, joined a, a British delegation that was driving over land to Turin. And on the way, I became quite smitten with a, a, young, a young man from Scotland. And we got to Turin, and uh, I said something to him, suggesting we could maybe get together. And he said, I didn't come to Italy to sleep with an Irishman. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I think lots of us when we arrived here um, had similar sorts of feelings we didn't want to we wanted to get absorbed and, 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 and enjoy the melting pot that, that London is so I think people initially wanted some comfort from home and, and looked to the diaspora but they were also escaping from the wider Irish diaspora, which, you know, restricted their freedoms. And um, I, I can think of, of some people who've almost gone back into the closet, even though they still live here. And that's partly because of, of being uncomfortable around the, the wider Irish community. Um, I was thinking there, Eamon, I mean, you know, a lot of what you're talking about is a lot of my research over the past year has been so interested in hearing these kind of stories, which are things that slip through in terms of the archive of, of Irish immigration history, like these little anecdotes and stories, and even these entire movements that slip out of view. And yet there also has been, certainly since the marriage equality referendum, a real mobilization around um, creating a public memory of, of the Irish queer past, of archiving, of, of oral histories and so on, and I kind of want to turn on that point to um, to Kat and Richard and to ask you both about, you know, have you kind of undergone a recovery or, or, a, or, or you know, rediscovering or discovering indeed Ireland's LGBTQ plus history? And has that been important to both how you kind of conceive of your activism and your own our work as well? I'm thinking, I guess, Richard, particularly with, with your new exhibition, with your grey exhibition, that yeah. that and particularly the local angle too, that being important. Yeah, I think it's it's really like, I think that there's a, a huge fundamental problem with everything is the amount of activism and progress that people make in real life, in real time that is experienced by groups of people. And then our kind of education's lack of funding or lack of interest in protecting those things and what gets told to you and what gets protected to you. And I think especially with queer people, so much of those histories are, are left out or they're told in ways that are like, without sounding terrible, they're a bit derogatory towards queer people or they make being, especially in Ireland, they make being queer or gay or whatever, they make it seem like it's a sickness, even still, even when they're teaching about it being accepted. Um, and I think that there isn't really, there's never spaces made for like, like love and respect and those things that you get in heterosexual relationships and the way they're told. And I think that that's something that's really lacking. It's also really lacking in recent history. It's really lacking in things like, I don't know, even the way that we kind of re keep reteaching the, the sort of AIDS epidemic, you know, as this thing. And like, I think even, you know, recent TV shows about it, there's really 
quite sinister messages that like everyone dies, you know, like every main character in that recent show, what was it called? It's Sin dies, you know, and that's kind of what people are growing, growing up with. And I think it feels a bit like there's more nuanced stories that could be told. And it's, it's like, even with the Eileen Gray thing, I mean, that's someone who didn't really even identify as bisexual, lesbian, straight, whatever. She just did what she wanted and was really, um, enthusiastic and informed and single-minded and has had this huge influence on the world of everything really art architecture textiles um and that's really fantastic and we can say that all of those things came from this radical queer woman but then also that radical queer woman had access to millions and millions of pounds and that's another conversation of kind of what voices get protected and heard the, the most um so yeah i think like and i think this exhibition at epic it's really important because it puts people who aren't famous in the spotlight because they're actually the people that did the work. And I think it's a nice thing to go back to about, you know, activism being being very popular. It's very popular to look like you're being an activist and actually looking at people who've done the work not for that reason. Before social media, before it was cool to like share a meme and give a link to some GoFundMe page or whatever, you know, like these are people who've actually done the work because it affected their own lives directly. And that's a really powerful thing. I think to discover and look at, not like even to like say, like my parents and stuff find it amazing because they there's names in that show that they've never heard of that have made huge fundamental changes to the opportunities that I have because of that and the opportunities that I have to, I guess even like speak and be confident and all of the different sort of subtleties that we don't realize are have been built upon other people's um, sacrifices and actions. Yeah, even in the last like I did my leaving cert five years ago and. I learned nothing about queer people in history in school. Nothing. Uh, like, if you have, if you want to learn about it, like, you kind of have to take it upon yourself to do that. Like, I'm only learning now, and I'm 23. Like, it was never spoken about in school, and it is kind of put in a derogatory kind of way in school as well. Like, it is talked about, so it's still kind of like this weird taboo that's not to be spoken about when you're growing up, which is really damaging. I think because then you don't know all these things that you should know as you get older and stuff like that so it's still happening um i guess uh, as well uh you know richard brought up the it's a sin and there's there is a lot of discussion now because we're, we're living through an ongoing pandemic as well around hiv aids history and i wonder thinking again of people who, who did the work turning to you both and I guess talking about experience and what do you do you think that you know what is getting lost in the sort of the public conversation about that historical memory do you think that there is a, a, a good recognition now of the, the level of activism that was done or do you think that more could be done to kind of highlight that i know that myself and Eamon have talked about the the work specifically that was done in the diaspora right and, and the hiv aids and its history in ireland is in many cases a diaspora history so many people had to leave that and that, that, that part of the story doesn't seem to exist within kind of the Irish popular memory. I remember hearing about a family in Derry and the son had AIDS and his mum said, well, of course you're coming home, aren't you? And we're going to look after you. And I remember that just really moving me and really connecting with that sense of you could bring all of yourself back. And... Um, yeah, it, it was it was really, is it being spoken about in the way, well, there are many, many histories of history, aren't there? How it's told, who controls it. Um, and I mean, I suppose for me, it's a sin. There weren't enough women involved in it, so I gave up after one episode. So um, I, just, I just felt like looking at the pandemic and realizing how little information we had, you know, especially this time last year. Um, and uh, with AIDS, a lot of us were at the forefront of doing research and finding things out and, and you know, kind of campaigning for medicines and, and research. And it felt like we were at the forefront of telling people about the myths that, you know, and, and, and going out there and, and Kind of fighting the government propaganda and i suppose now I, I 
you know, it's so hard because the propaganda is everywhere and it's so powerful through social media. And, you know, it, it feels um, like the beast of it is, is a totally different shape and, and there's many different te tentacles. So I feel like, you know, you can look back and say, well, you know, AIDS activism and what happened. There are, you know, there are many stories and there are many stories of what is going to happen with COVID and how we, you know, are shaped by it in ways we won't know yet, you know, for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I feel like um, there have been also amazing representations. There was an Australian film about two, um, a playwright and his lover and um, how they both kind of contracted AIDS around the same time. And it, it was an incredible love story. And it, you know, often gay films end when the people come out or get together. And this was how they ma managed their relationship through this terrible um, you know, pandemic and fear of dying and, and death. And it's, you know, there are extraordinary representations of it and in books as well. And I guess in kind of thinking through similar questions, I guess if you could speak to sort of the, you know, what, what as someone who was here in London in the late 80s, what stories do you think are, are missing? What stories need to be recovered in terms of the London Irish community's response to the AIDS epidemic? I was, um, as part of, as uh, for preparation for today, I was Googling some things and looking at the, uh, Archive network archive um, on Irish. I don't know what it's called. Irish in London archive or something. Um, I remember going to speak to uh, a, a, a meeting of the Irish in Britain representation group, and uh, looking at their article, uh, an article about them. There's no mention of LGBT things. They're they're all kind of being sanitized out perhaps, uh, I, I'm not quite sure. Um, but I did find a French article um, um, uh, about, with an interview for a woman called Siobhan O'Reilly, who was the director of Positively Irish Action on AIDS. And um, it, it, she was interviewed in 1986 and she said, one of the ironies of our work is that we actually have people in Dublin phone us to find out what's happening elsewhere in Ireland because we have this unique pan-Ireland knowledge about what's happening. We also inform services in Ireland about the needs of people coming in. Um, so there was quite a movement here. I, 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 I haven't had um, Cherry's um, direct involvement myself, but uh, we were running in parallel with um, Positively Irish and the, um, the telephone network located in their office and we used their, their telephone providers so that was how we, we managed the, the, uh, the helpline. Mm -hmm. So if there are any audience questions I'd be happy to take some um, I can ask some more questions while you're thinking. One that I was going to ask question for everyone what do you see as the sort of the next next great frontier of activism in Ireland or in the diaspora? <laughs> well, I think I think the big important one is uh, uh, Cherry has referred to it is is, um, is climate change is going to affect us all, um, but I think um, uh, um, trans issues and, and and gender dysphoria is is is, is clearly um, going to seems to be, I mean I have a sense that actually Irish people in Ireland are more relaxed about it than um, than the British media. British people. I was listening to Women's Women's Hour during the week, and um, uh, Emma, I can't remember Emma, her second name, the, uh, the interviewer, uh, was interviewing a Scottish uh, uh, Lib Dem MP, and um, on the question, and she was asking these really pointed and, and and aggressive questions. I thought, and the the MP kept saying. Well, I think we need to try and calm down and reach some sort of general discussion rather than 
hammering at each other from, from our positions. And um, it, it's just easy to get through. And uh, my daughter lives in Sydney, and she's involved in, um, in, um, in women's health and, and, and lesbian issues. And she says, she's shocked at the way uh, here in Britain we, we deal with or we, we respond to uh, um, um, gender issues and trans issues. It's, um, we seem to be stuck in something quite strange and unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anecdotally I've, I've heard that it's, you know, it's, it's kind of twisted, it's, it's turned this, this history on its head where you have um, trans people coming to Ireland because it's been accepted. Yeah, and anyone else want to talk about what do you think kind of the, the next, what are the really kind of important causes at the moment? You lost that question, sorry. <laughs> it's kind <laughs> of really you, quiet. Well, we were just um, talking about uh, uh, the, you know, um, trans activism being a really important cause at the moment, both here in, in Britain and in Ireland. And what do you think are this, is a very important cause? What's dear to you at the moment? What are you working on in terms of your work? activist cause. I missed it again. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some kind of echo, so I just, I can okay. see your lips moving and all I can do. Is, oh, Don't worry, <laughs> we can, um, if anyone else wants to add on. Well, I'd like to mention unification again. <laughs> um, funny how people from the North think that's an issue and people from the South forget it's an issue, but um, it's a big issue. And I'd like to see it in my lifetime, I really would. Um, and, you know, so that makes us think about how can we talk to unionists and persuade them of the benefits of being a whole country. And um, I did a project recently, which I wouldn't call activist, but it felt pretty scary at times walking through Porter Down and around July the 12th, but I, I followed the, the course of the river ban um, just walking from its source to the mouth and looking at what has changed in, in my country since I left and could I go back and asking those questions and can I go back with all of me or can you go back and you have to leave your sexuality at the um, airport and um, you know I think those things are definitely opening up but there's also as Kat was mentioned the surge in bigotry and terrible racism as well. I mean, I think racism and, and you know, racial justice is going to be a big thing in Ireland as, as more people of colour um, move there or born there. Um, and uh, that's something I would feel very involved in. Black Lives Matter instigated stuff where I, a university where I work around that. And uh, again, trans issues of instigated things about that, really to learn all the new language of it that's very new from when I came out. Um, and that's an ongoing <coughs> thing about how your activism evolves and changes and, um, yeah. Anybody, other ideas about what they think are the, are the frontiers of Irish activism and what they would, what they're involved in or would like to be involved in? It'd be nice to hear what some of you are doing. Nobody's sitting on the M25. <laughs> the, what is it called? The New Green Deal rising. Um, so XR has been taken over by two more radical groups, Insulate Britain and New Green Deal rising. So, you know, if you want to get out there and really do something very dramatic and maybe get arrested, now's the time. <laughs> <laughs> Intergenerational fairness. fairness, not affairs. Okay. Uh, no, not affairs. <laughs> no, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. Intergenerational fairness and the way that wealth in Ireland is <coughs> stuck and cleaves to the older generation who have benefited. And I am a member of that older generation. Um, and I'm one of young people from what we call it housing. They, they have insecure jobs. And, and that's that's going to have to change, and I don't know how it's going to change, but it's not going to be pretty. Yeah, I agree. 
zero hour contracts. Yeah, if I you mean, get a job. If we were to do a straw poll, I mean, how many people are here in London rather than Ireland because of housing prices? You know, we'd say it's probably quite a few, yeah. I'm trying my best. <laughs> 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 Dublin is impossible to live in. It's genuinely impossible. Like, I've lived in horrific places that are just extortionate. It's not like you're paying good money for a nice place to live. Like, it's awful. And, like, you move into a house and the windows are falling out and, like, slugs on the walls like it's horrible it's it's a really massive problem mm, mm, mm. yeah i also wonder what is there something that the irish experience of activism can teach other communities i think you know a lot of people a lot of people i talk to particularly because i spend a lot of time in britain as well <clears throat> are really baffled by the hostility towards trans people in britain but thinking through why that doesn't exist in ireland such work as it, it won't be fostered in Ireland like it was here. And part of me thinks that's about kind of the intimacy of, of Ireland in a sense that you know who your friends are and you know who your enemies are to an extent. You see the same people opposing you year after year after year. And so those demarcation lines can be quite clear. But I think a lot in trying to think what does Ireland offer? What does its example offer? And a lot of people talk about kind of intersectionality the repeal campaign being a model for a form of activism. And that was a really transformative experience, I think, for, for generations of people coming through that campaign. Yeah. I wonder if it's anything to do with tabloid culture, because tabloid culture in Britain is just so vile, and it's always looking for people to vilify and demonize, and that is not so developed in Ireland. And I think, you know, they, yeah, they just make it kind of impossible to, you know, represent a difference that they're not prepared to accept yet. You know, they've done it, you know, with different groups over the years. I've seen it happening. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. I didn't really realize it, it wasn't so vilified in Ireland. I haven't, yeah, I think you're right. Mm. Why else would that be? So any more audience questions? You've asked an audience more questions. I'm going to make this a bit of a like I live in Halifax in England, and it's like actually walking around thinking of the Halifax. You know, young people, sorry. Young people, I think this is too loud now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just think that, you know, people are more aware of their mental health and the fact that actually the mental health services in Ireland are is diabolical. And even in London, it's not great. They are trying. Mm -hmm. But it, it's just the whole idea of how do people help themselves whilst there is no help around them? How can art help with that? <laughs> well, I think that um, I think that reading and, and, and following, uh, well, if we're speaking specifically about the LGBT community, it's um, supporting the film festival every year and um, there's, there's gay plays that run all the time and, 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 and building up the sense of confidence as a result of it, it, it interacting with the culture, I think, is, is how I would suggest. I mean, it's, if, we're, if we're not ignoring the culture, then we're benefiting. as well as to do with open-mindedness like being open-minded can change everything if you're open-minded about stuff people will naturally talk about it like easier it's it's much easier to talk to someone who you know will be more understanding but in Ireland it's it's hard to find that like I find that issue that people are so close-minded in especially the rural areas of Ireland so it can be tricky and I think that that if we fixed that a little bit more, I think the mental health would also benefit from that because people would be kind of feel more like able to talk about things. So I think that that's something that could be looked at for sure. Mm -hmm. Having said that, uh, Sherry mentioned uh, positive images and, and in the 80s, and certainly in Haringey when they were putting together policies, the idea of po positive images and visibility 
is absolutely essential to everything they do. And I'm, I got a notice this morning, Facebook invitation or something to tell me about Pride Yaw. So this is Yaw in County Cork. That's iconic. <laughs> and I think it's wonderful. Every bloody hole in the hedge in Ireland seems to be having a Pride <laughs> That's true. And I think it's great. It's great. Um, it's about visibility. And I, 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 I think it works hand in glove with, um, with art and culture. Richard, Richard can't hear the audience questions. Can you hear us okay now? I can hear you, yeah, when you talk directly into the microphone. Okay. <laughs> well, we were talking really, Richard, about how art can help people feel less isolated, um, uh, can help in terms of mental health as well. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, completely. I mean, I think it's a, like it's, it's really important to value whatever that output is for people. I think especially not even in the last year when personal experiences but being queer people or being from outside of cosmopolitan places all of those things i think art really opens the door in the conversation between artists that happens in cities and i mean that like in terms of cross-disciplinary musicians speaking to artists and writers and poets and all of those conversations create really incredible dialogues and i always think that making something difficult or challenging like if, especially if i'm doing things that are more like performance driven or don't make sense or fall into a realm of between you know costume and making and performance i find those really rewarding because it's really hard to judge them and i think it's the same with things like um experimental poetry or experimental writing you know it's really hard to judge it because of the way things are judged now often is on things like likes or popularity and it's actually when things are tricky or difficult or really um, exposing of a part of your core or your person it's, it's, it's quite refreshing and I think that it's, it's a, like for me it's like a compulsion you have to do it all the time and I get really I get really off on the experimentation of it all so I think it's something that it's really important to keep up but also something it's really important to be cognizant of keeping the door open for people because I think it's more and more difficult to find a way in now uh, because it's you know it's such an expensive thing to do as an education now. But I, I also think it's it's vital. So sometimes we need to find different ways in and different ways of sort of um, I guess extending what we know to the next generation, keeping that conversation going, which is sort of what that show with Eileen Gray is about. It's about you know, cross-disciplinary and cross-century and what that means and what, you know, radicalism is and all of those things. But um, I always think of it as like a kind of mad, spiritual, witchy thing that's very Irish. You know, it's kind of, it's not like, it goes back to very ancient times of like expression and that sort of the stuff that I get the most excited about. But yeah, it's vital. Mm. Any other questions from the audience? There's a mic. Hi, it's more of a, I mean, question and a statement. I was terribly late, I'm really sorry, but when I seen the topic of the event and theme that LGBT arts and activists in Irish diaspora of immigrants, I'm representing Polish LGBTQ uh, uh, activists in amongst uh, Polish immigrants in London. I've been doing it for more or less 10 years and one thing which you mentioned recently that what can we learn from, from Ireland? I mean, people Poland is looking at Ireland with hope and, you know, keep your all fingers and toes crossed. We are being a same, very, very strict, very Catholic, very traditional country. And yet all those things were possible. I was there when the, I lived in Ireland for a couple of years. I was there when the repeal campaign was on and I, completely loved that every uh, every second lamppost had like yes no yes no yes no it was all over the place you know and, uh, and my stepmom is, is irish so i have connections there and every time i when i used to go to the bars people would be like oh only polish people will tell me don't be too gay at this bar no irish person ever came up to me like you're too gay for you know to be here so it seems like this change in Catholic countries and amongst migrants as well is possible 
we're still fa facing a lot of hate from our fellow migrants in London that, you know, don't bring your gayness here. You know, we, when we do events at Polish Embassy, <coughs> we're never ever invited officially like you're here. You know, there's no way we could host an event about LGBTQ activism in any Polish official institution here. So I guess I'm watching this and I'm like, oh my God, this is possible. So maybe in the next 10 years, we'll be able to host similar event, some yeah. in Polish center or, you know, but I guess it's, it's that, that's kind of a statement I wanted to make that it's amazing to see how far Ireland came, you know, and then yeah. how far can we have to still learn and, and go. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting to think through the parallel of Poland, because of course, there's such a large Polish community in Ireland as well, too. Um, yeah, and I, I wish I could boil it down for you and say, here's the 10 point plan of how you get from <laughs> being a Catholic country to, you know, um, to being kind of this more inclusive Ireland. But um, yeah, I wouldn't. And it's very frightening what's happening in Poland, isn't it? Yeah, loads we're going of, back, I think we're going yeah. backwards now. Loads yeah. of cities are voting against gay rights, and you know, it's, it's frightening for people. And that's very interesting looking at the whole horrible right wing nationalism that's emboldened here, and that doesn't seem to be happening in Ireland. And that's another thing that, that sort of, yeah, why is it sort of not, not developing? not developed, not supportive, not thriving. And that's really concerning here as well. Um, just the, you know, the kind of right-wing establishment and sen sense of entitlement and exceptionalism that I see around me a lot. And, you know, that is another thing that if you're here, you have to get involved in somehow counteracting Yeah, I wonder if anyone else has any advice for the Pol Polish comrades in the struggle. There's Lauer's in Borska. It's mm -hmm. all the advice you need. If you can create a poet oh, like that. If all oh. she would appreciate it as much as she should personally, you know. Yeah. <laughs> she was yeah. an enemy of the people from the government, so there we go. <laughs> yeah. It's a disaster. going to invite, Cherry has a, a, a piece that she's written that she apparently offered to read for us. So do you want to introduce Cherry? And sure, then? sure. Thank you. Thanks, Morris, for also for organizing this. It's been really interesting just to think about and to be part of. And thank you for coming. Um, and I think we should do another one next year. And then everyone comes and reports what they've done for Poland and what they've done for <laughs> porpoises or whatever it is. Um, this is not totally autobiographical, but it's kind of what they call now autofiction, I guess. And um, I was just thinking about when I left and the some of the things that, um, it's interesting because I wrote this poetry collection on the famine and um, someone said to me, oh, the queer famine. And I thought, God, how can I bring queerness into the famine? You know, and it just felt like that was just too sacrosanct. I couldn't do it. And um, so I wrote this piece called Queer Famine. And it, it, it has two bad words in it. So cover your ears. I'm going to say them now. Anyone, the two four letter words beginning with C. Anyone got an idea? I'll get you to say them. That could be your bit of lesbian activism for tonight. Okay, whoops. One is clit. Terrible word. The other one is cunt. Okay, so I've said them, and they're considered two of the worst words in the English language. Why is it? Why is it? You know, we've all passed through this beautiful place. 
You don't understand it. Anyway, queer famine, 1982. I was hungry. I was hunting for food. I was ravenous. I wanted the girl in the picture. I wanted to swallow the girl in the classroom who looked like a boy whose crop and school tie made me mistake her for one, needed her to be a boy. Oh, why did I want her? None of the other girls could see that boy. None of them could see my hunger. I made sure of that. I ate all the time. I ate to keep silent, to keep full, to digest myself, to throw up my disgust, to fill and empty at the same time, to hide my appetite, this queer appetite that nothing could satisfy. I took my hunger to bed. I began to eat secretly. I started with Ruby Kifruit Jungle by Rita Mae Brown, then The Color Purple by Alice Walker, poems by Judy Graham. I ate words as proof that I could live, that I could kiss a girl, that I could be held in a girl's arms and not be sent away or killed or starved. I ate words to taste them in my mouth, to learn, to dare, to say them, lesbian, dyke, Lit, cunt, come, let me eat you. But the words flavor was slightly wrong. They tasted of hash browns, not mashed spuds. They left an aftertaste of Budweiser, not Bush Mills. Until I tasted a noise from the woodshed by Mary Dorsey and found a feast, a way to be at home in my body, my desire and my land where in 1982, it was still illegal to be gay. And, uh, before I ask for an applause for all our panelists, I'll just one final quick question, which is for everyone else in the audience, where can we find more of your work? Over for there. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, where can yes, you? over there and uh, yeah. in any bookshop. Oh yeah, and all my books are a five or a special price, just special. so I don't have to carry them home. <laughs> <laughs> and can, can I? I wanted to say something about um, um, queer famine. Um, David Rees, I think his name was, who wrote um, one of the first uh, um, British gay fiction in the nineteen seventies. Alexander was away, and he wrote a dreadful novel after that, um, set during the famine in Ireland. Oh, <laughs> with gay characters? With, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I never came across that no. in my research. The whole genre. <laughs> 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 uh, Cash, where can we find? I have nothing over there. Um, <laughs> you can just find me on Spotify. Uh, if you look up, it's just Kat. I have a new song coming out this Friday. Uh, also Ooh. on Instagram, it's What's Kat at? So yeah, check me out. And uh, Richard, where can we find your work? Uh, where can we pick up your new Mulberry handbag, for example? <laughs> Is it one for everyone in the audience, or? <laughs> yeah, there's one under your seat. <laughs> I'll leave you with that in point. Um, what the question? <laughs> yeah. The question was, where can people find more of your work? Where can we see your current exhibition? You know. Current exhibition, uh, the one in the V&A is over, but the National Museum one closes tomorrow, so if you happen to be in Dublin, <laughs> <laughs> you'll get to see it. Um, and then it's in... Wexford, it comes to Wexford next, uh, I don't know what month, but 2022 sometime. The whole time is Vortex, but it will be next year. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. <laughs>